What is happening, y'all? Cowboy here, and welcome to my review of Elden Ring. Now, a big thanks to Bandai Namco for a review copy of the game. Um, just up front, this review is going to be relatively spoiler-free. Obviously, we're going to be talking about, you know, like my opinions and quest designs and whatnot, but I'm not telling you about the story or what the zones are like or bosses or anything like that. That should be obvious. Anybody who does that in a review is garbage. Uh, but anyway... Beyond that, a couple things up front. Uh, this review is mainly based on my experience with the PC version. I also started playing on PS5, but there's just so much to this game. It was hard to do both at the same time. So a little bit of experience on the PS5 version of the game uh, and a lot of experience on the PC version of the game. Uh, just to be transparent, how much experience? I am currently at about 85 hours in game. Uh, I have done everything I could find. I got, I got the ending. I got you know, almost every boss I could find. Uh, and the crazy thing is there's still more. There's, there's still places that I can visibly see from the world that I don't know how to reach and bosses whose names I've heard that I know are out there somewhere, but I don't know where they're at. Uh, and so to break it on down, like honestly, when it comes down to it, if somebody was like, uh, you know, what was the one thing that encompasses Elden Ring to you? It would be, there's more. Every, every time you think that you're about to be done with a zone or a dungeon or whatever the case is, there's more. Like, you think you're almost there, and then, oh, no, hey, how about, a, how about an extra zone? Or, you know, okay, I remember I, was, I thought I was getting close to the end of the game. I was like, all right, I'm almost there. This is it. I'm going to go to the place and do the thing. And then I was like, what if we slapped a whole second zone at your face? I was like, wait, what? Oh, okay, all right, I got that. I got that. And then I get through it, and it would be like, what if we added, like, two more zones to it. And I'd be like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, I got that. What if we added like just a couple other zones and places that you've never been that, that you're gonna find out about now? Like it just kept going and it never stopped. And it's, it's honestly, it is difficult to put into words the sheer scope of how much there is to do in this game. Uh, if you have been waiting for big souls, this is it. This is big souls. Um, now, in terms of souls, I will say that, that this game is pretty much an evolution of Dark Souls 3. If you were expecting Sekiro or Bloodborne, you're not going to find it here. This is, this is a very natural evolution of Dark Souls 3. Uh, even, you know, kind of animations, movement, all that stuff. It feels very, like if you had just played Dark Souls 3 and you jumped to this, you're going to be right at home. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have, have asked that. They're like, you know, well, how, how much Sekiro influence is there? Minimal, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, big, big Souls, Dark Souls 3 evolution, and, and honestly, an endless, near endless amount of content. Uh, so I got a couple of bullet points here. Uh, let's talk about combat for a little bit, because I have a lot of thoughts there. So combat in general is relatively what we've been used to up until now. Uh, weapon combos have been reworked, so most weapons have either like a three to five hit combo, depending like your large things, like your ultras, which are now called colossal weapons. Most of them have like a three hit chain. Uh, your, your basic weapons usually have a four hit chain and then your super fast weapons. I've seen some that have like five or six hit chains. Um, so it's not just, you know, one attack, two attack, one attack, two attack, which is, was the case in previous souls games. The weapon move sets have been updated a lot. So anybody that's like, oh, same animation hurt. No, you're an idiot. It's not the same animation. They're literally a brand new animation. Um, the amount of weapon variety is peak. Oh my God, dude, there's so much. And I'm not going to spoil it, but there are some returning fan favorites y'all can find in the game. Some that I saw and I was just like, oh, it's my baby. It's back. So really awesome weapons. Uh, in general, combat felt really good. And I played with a variety of things throughout my playthrough. Uh, I used a scythe for a good bit. I used a greatsword, like a regular greatsword, like Claymore style for a really long time. Uh, I used a halberd for a bit. I used a hammer. I used uh, a colossal sword at one point. I used a, a big hammer at one point, like a great hammer. So I was, I was mix and match and weapons as I went throughout. And one of the things I thought that was really nice is in terms of uh stats just having like you know a basic quality build and what i mean by basic is like you know i think i had uh for the most time i had like 20 strength and like 17 decks that opened up i would say like 75 percent of the weapons to me 
So I would suggest a quality build your first time through this game just because it's going to give you so much weapon variety to play with and get to try out new things. Uh, and in particular, I think one of the things that made it so much fun was the changes to weapon arts. So we now have the Ash of War system, which if you're not aware, it lets you anything that's like a basic weapon, you can effectively change out what its weapon art is. And at the same time, you can change the elemental damage on that weapon and it's scaling. So we don't need to go to a blacksmith to make our weapon refined or sharp or heavy or whatever the case is. We do that through the Ash system. Uh, and as you play the game, you'll find items that'll let you just really do that. And what I mean is initially, let's say you want a weapon to be uh, cold damage. You would have to have an Ash of War that's related to cold. So, you know, like you slam the ground and make a shockwave of cold or something. Uh, I don't even know if that, that's in the game. I'm just making that one up. But that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, later on, you find stuff that allows you to just say, hey, I want this weapon to have you know the the blood slash but i want it to have cold damage on it and you can do that so weapon customization hands down is the best it's ever been no questions asked uh, on top of that the unique weapons the one that have like weapon arts that are for those weapons only some of them are just outrageous like so unreal just so freaking cool it's like there, there were weapon arts that I was using that were like the level of effects that I would expect from like a mod where people are just going like crazy over the top with something badass, not something I would expect in, in you know, a new, a new actual mainline Souls game. So good, good, good stuff on the weapons front. Uh, talking about the spells uh, for my Let's Play, I did Faith. So... I don't have any experience with, uh, you know, the, the sorceries or whatnot, purely with the incantations, which faith is, is pretty varied in terms of incantations. Uh, we have fire type spells. We have your general lightning type spells. We have dragon type spells. We have uh, madness style spells. We have beast style spells. There, there's a lot. There is a lot. So faith definitely has a big variety on what it's able to use. And spell animations... Are, are really cool spell animations are probably the the best they've ever been um another big thing is some spells are chargeable so you can either you know toss it out or hold it and charge it so you have like a delayed activation on it and when you charge it it usually gets bigger does more damage goes farther stuff like that uh there's other spells that are like rapid use so you can tap the button multiple times and go like boom 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 and like you know quick toss out uh fireballs or something like that so in general, the changes to spell design, I really liked. With that being said, uh, not all spells were created equally in Elden Ring, and it is a big discrepancy. So there were a couple spells that I used that their damage for their FP was amazing. They were staples of almost the entire game. Ironically, two of them were in the network test, uh, Beast Claw and then Flame of Frenzy. Flame of Frenzy was my main boss nuke for a huge amount of the game. Um, but as I got later and I started finding the, the cooler spells and whatnot, a lot of times I was disappointed. Um, for example, I had some Black Flame type stuff that I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And the damage just wasn't really there. In general, fire spells I felt were really weak. Like I had, uh, I found one fire spell that was, just, it was like a 41 faith requirement, which is pretty far up there. It had a high FP cost. It was around like 40 or 50 FP, which is like, you know, half your bar. Uh, and I would hit for about 500 damage with it. And this was with like a near max talisman. And you're probably like, oh, well, 500 damage. Cowboy, that's a lot of damage. Yeah, well, my sword like swings for more than that. So it's really not a lot of damage. Uh, and it's something that I really hope that they take a look at spell damage because there's a, like the spells, the animations on them are really, really nice looking and really crisp but not all spells were created equally. And there are a lot of spells uh, that I just simply didn't use because the damage wasn't that good. Uh, on that note, another big, big problem with spells is there's zero poise. Um, you know, late game, my guy was poised up. I was basically in almost heavy armor and the spells for the most part, unless you were really far back, you weren't getting it off. There were a few spells I found that had built-in poise uh, where like, you know, stuff was going to try to attack you and you might still be able to get it out. 
But for the most part, and especially late game, an enemy would just walk up and slap you. And not even like, you know, like, you know, a Black Knight type enemy, just like a basic enemy of a late game zone. It would slap you right out of your spell mid cast. And I think one of the problems with that is all of the catalysts, none of them have built in skills. And in particular, I want to call uh, attention to like the Sunlight Talisman from Dark Souls 3. It had a unique skill where you could basically cast. Uh, with L2, and instead of just doing a cast, it would do a poise based cast. So it was a, it took like, I'm trying to remember if it, I think it cost a little bit more, but basically it gave your character some poise so that you could tank a hit to the face, but you were going to get out your spell. And there's nothing like that, at least that I found in 85 hours of playing. And the result is essentially mages can just get rushed down. Like if you're ever doing PvP and you go against a mage, just stay on top of them, just continually slap them, and they're never going to get cast off. So I definitely want to see the damage on spells normalized. Uh, there shouldn't be such a big discrepancy between certain spells. And I, I think there needs to be some form of poise because it felt like almost like your, your poise was largely from your weapon now as opposed to your armor. I mean, there is a poise stat, but a lot of the times I would get poise breaks when I was playing with a great sword. When I was using a colossal, I would constantly get poise breaks. Like, I just, it didn't matter. If I was swinging, stuff wasn't hitting me. It didn't matter. But trying to cast spells interrupted constantly, which results in a very, like, hiding in the background playing playstyle as a mage, which, you know, it is what it is, but I don't necessarily like that. So I hope that is something they decide to look at uh, when it comes to kind of balancing the game. Uh, jumping out from there, world design. Um, world design was outrageously good. Uh, the zones have so much stuff to do and like both stuff that, that you can find that's like noted on your map. Like you stumble into a ruin and then you can see on your map, oh, okay, this is, you know, a dragon song ruins or whatever. All right, cool. Let's go inside. And then even little things that aren't really on the map, but you go over there and then there's like an NPC or, you know, a unique item or, or something. So there's just a ridiculous amount of, of stuff in the world for you to discover and experience and you know dungeons and catacombs and world bosses uh i found bosses that would only appear at night uh you know and not just like the night riders from the network test like really cool night based bosses so some really really cool world design there um the daylight cycle in particular it, it changed things up at night you would see a lot more stuff you know, like your typical undead type stuff would come out at night. But so minor differences in the enemies you would find in a zone, depending if it was night or day, you know, massive differences in how zones would look with, you know, the lighting and the fog rolling in the morning and stuff like that. Uh, and just the general ambience, like when you're just cruising around on torrent, running through a zone, like it feels good. It feels really good. Um, and what I think is interesting is, is, you know, you think something like Skyrim. Skyrim, I'm, ne I'm not paying attention. I'm just, I'm running. My horse is there to get me from A to B, and that is it. And as I played this, I was constantly hopping off my horse and seeing stuff and wanting to go interact with it. And I think that's a really special feeling. I'd almost say it's comparable. Like when I was playing Ghost of Tsushima and I was just, you know, riding around on the horse and then I'd be like, oh, what is this? I want to go interact with it. It was a very similar feeling to that. Um, whereas like when I was playing Horizon, for example, Horizon, I was very objective focused. Like I would see stuff and I'd be like, I'm going from A to B. I'm not getting distracted. A, A to B, that's it. Like there wasn't a lot of, of, you know, organic explorative items in Horizon. There were a couple, you know, your things like your relic ruins and whatnot uh, and your Vista points. But for the most part, I feel like Horizon was very bubbled off on like, here's your stuff. And there's lots of stuff to do. But the, the organic approach to where you're just like wandering the world and discovering stuff is really nice here. And it's something I like a lot. Um, I'm going to touch on it briefly. Audio I felt was good. Uh, I actually felt it was a little bit better than usual. Uh, the, the boss music wasn't suddenly blowing out my ears as much as it usually is. So big improvement there. Uh, now moving on, I want to talk about an area that I'm sure is going to be a little bit controversial and get the haters to come out a little bit. And that is quest design. Now, Souls games have always had a very obscure approach to quest design. You know, meet NPC out in the wild, 
meet NPC out in the wild a little bit later, and then meet NPC out in the wild a third time. And, you know, I'm fine with that. I think it's always worked. But I also think it's always worked because Souls games are usually a closed loop. And, you know, you can make your way through the zones and you won't miss stuff. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case with an open world environment. Uh, and I think a good example of this is, so for example, I, I had a quest I did where we're going to keep it vague. I met a lady and she wanted a grape and I gave her a grape and she was like, oh, the grape lets me see. And she wandered off. Fast forward like 30, 45 minutes later, I met the lady again. I happened to find a second grape nearby and I'm like, oh, hey, grape lady. Okay, let's give her another grape. Gave her a grape. Thank you for the grape. Wanders off. Don't see her again for a while. Don't even think about it. Uh, much later in the zone, I end up fighting a dude. He drops an item. That item is like a special grape. And I look at the description and it's like, oh, you know, the, the grape that will lead the maiden to where she has to go. And I'm like, dope. This is the final thing for Grape Lady. The problem is I never found Grape Lady again. After like two and a half hours of searching that zone, like I searched during an episode and then off the episode, just sat around and kept searching. I could not find her. I scoured everywhere I could look. I, I you know, I, and that's how I found other NPCs. I actually, I found the, uh, I found the NPC for the PVP quest line by scouring the world for Grape Lady, but I never found her. And what's weird is there's certain quests that they'll actually put a marker on your map. They'll be like, oh, you want to do blah, blah, blah. I've marked your map, go there. And you're gonna go to that place and you're gonna find something. And then a whole quest is gonna get underway. Um, there's other NPCs that'll give you items like, oh, you need to go talk to XYZ. And then they're going to give you an item and then you can look at that item and it says, you know, item intended for XYZ of the, you know, the royal home in Lancaster or something. So it, like you have an idea like, oh, this person is there. Um, but then there's other times where it's just hyper vague and you have no idea. I have one quest where the guy gave me an item and he's like, go find, uh, go find N. And I'm like, who's N? And he's like, oh, yeah, just, just go find her. I'm like where, bro? Where, where? Give me. Wait, is she is she out east in the eastern region? Is she up north in the northern region? Do you think she might be down south? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just find her. Like you can't give somebody a letter and tell them to deliver it and not put an address on it, my guy. And that's that's the thing is this game could have benefited even from like a super super vague journal. And I guess to to better. Uh, talk about this. So taking, going back to my Grape Lady quest, something like, you know, just, just give me bullet points. Like I met, uh, or uh, I met a maiden that needed a grape. I gave her a grape and she went north. I met the maiden again. I gave her another grape. She headed northeast. There, that's all I need. She headed northeast. Great. I will search from the last place I saw her all the way northeast across the world if I need to, to find Grape Lady. But I never found Grape Lady. And I looked everywhere I could think of and I had no idea where to find her and stuff like that. You know, like at the end of the day, it didn't ruin my enjoyment of the game. I had a great time with it, but it bothered me slightly. And it's, you know, I think it's just the design of a Souls game. I don't think that hyper vague approach works all that well in an open world environment. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a discrepancy because there were other quests. Like there was one quest I did that involved like finding a whole hidden area and i like talked to a dude and he was like oh, i'm looking i don't know where it's at but so and so probably has a hint so then i went and i talked to so and so and so and so gave me a hint and was like oh go talk to blotty blah and then i went to go talk to blotty blah and blotty blah was like oh to do it you need to do objective x and then i did objective x and then the quest continued but you know there was a natural evolution of person to person to person to person and this was a little bit of a bigger side quest. This like involved an important NPC and stuff. So it made sense. But then you have your side quests like Grape Lady that just get left unfinished. Like who knows? She's, she's probably dead by now. That swamp is filled with like giant crabs and lobsters and stuff. She, she probably got eaten. But I'll never know, will I? So anyway, um, I've had that on my chest a while, man. I, it, that, that Grape Lady is going to haunt me in my dreams. But so, I, yeah, I mean, it's weird because like I said, there's, there's certain quests that they give you information on where to go or the NPC will be like, try talking to, you know, this person and you'll talk to that person and you'll get an idea. But like, I mean, hell, even then, I, I feel like most of the time I was taking the game, I had 
Discord up and I was writing little notes on stuff just to remember like, oh, I met this person here. Uh, this person said I had to go do this. You know, there was a lot of times where like playing this game with a journal is, is almost a necessity. Uh, moving on from that, it's time to talk about the ugly and oh boy, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, man. PC performance is rough. It is really rough. Uh, there's a memory leak. I would start the game. I'd be at like three point or what did I start at? I started at like 6.5 gigabytes of RAM. And after a couple minutes, I was up to like, you know, I'd be playing for an hour and I'd be up to like 7.8. Um, I've had visual glitches, shader errors, um, you know, and not, not like Skyrim bugs. There were a couple Skyrim bugs. I'll talk about that stuff in a bit. But just in general, uh, PC performance was, it was, it was rough. Uh, console, it felt better. It didn't feel as shaky. But like one of the big things on PC is I'd, so I started off playing like 4K Ultra and was like, okay, maybe it's, you know, maybe I'm just pushing out things too high. So I dropped, jumped it down to like high, same issues. Chopped it down to medium, same issues. Asked my buddy who was playing in 1440, same issues. And I don't know what it is because even while I was playing, I checked resource manager and I mean, I have an RTX 3080 and a uh, AMD 3090X processor. And my processor was like under 30% utilization. The GPU was under 60%. And this is with the latest drivers. So like the game wasn't pushing stuff to its limit. You know, there's, it's like, there's clearly juice in the tank and the game's not even utilizing it, but you would be playing and it'd be like smooth 60, smooth 60, smooth 60. And then boom, all of a sudden plummet to like, 10 fps and you're like oh what is happening is my you know, my game crashing what's going on and then it just resolves and i'm like oh my god what is ha what what just happened to me and you know from what i've heard from other people that are, are mainly on console that wasn't as big of a case uh my pc experience was 85 hours my console experience was like five and i didn't notice that in the five hours i spent on console but i also didn't reach the more problematic zones on my console experience but still it's you know, it needs to be said. PC performance, frankly, it's 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 bad. It's, it's not good. It's not pretty. Um, I expected it to be smoother, and this is with the current NVIDIA drivers for the game. So I really hope they took a look at PC performance because I mean, as the Let's Play comes out, and y'all see, y'all y'all will see the stuff I'm talking about. There's some really rough points. Um, moving on from there. Some of the bugs I encountered were were doozies. Um, now let me be upfront. I think with a open world game and especially an open world game at the scale of this, I think some bugs are going to be expected. You know, it's it's just the nature of the beast. It is a huge game with countless hours of things to do. Obviously, not everything is going to be flawless. That's that's just you know, how it is. Uh, you know, look at look at Skyrim, look at Fallout. Just tons and tons and tons of bugs. Um, and I would put this closer to one of those than, you know, something like, like, uh, say horizon or ghost of Tsushima. I mean, it doesn't have the role playing elements, but world size is, is massive in this game. So with that being said, man, I had some, well, so I had a couple minor bugs. I had stuff like I would mount on torrent and like my character just wouldn't mount. Um, I'd have to hit it a couple times. I had times where I would try to mount torrent. And my character would like jump to mount, but torrent wouldn't appear. And I would just stay stuck in the air. And eventually the game would just kill me and respawn me. And stuff like that. I can live with that. That's easy. But then I had, uh, and this, I had a dragon I was fighting, right? I'm beating the dragon. I'm getting the kill. Basically I, I line up for a critical on its face. Dragon just disappears. Despawns completely. Uh, left the zone, came back, rested, all that stuff. Dragon never came back, just gone. I had another dragon that I was fighting, mid-fight with the dragon, same thing, dragon just vanished. And this one looks like it vanished on purpose, but never found that dragon again the rest of my playthrough. Uh, went through a whole area that had a bunch of dragons, didn't find that dragon. Uh, the game has these mausoleum things. They're, they're like you know the big, slow uh, walking dungeons, and you can use them to, basically you can duplicate boss souls with them. Uh, I opened two and I didn't have a boss soul on me at the time and they bugged out. So when I went to interact with them, there was just nothing, no menu, like just didn't do anything. 
And what's weird is you open it and it explicitly states, you know, hey, these can be used to uh, duplicate boss souls, including those that you've already redeemed to get weapons and whatnot. These just bugged. So like two potential instances of boss souls just gone. Um, and then one of the biggest ones, this one, this one really threw me for a loop. So when I first started playing the game, I rebound my interact key to X and my uh, my jump key to triangle because you know X has been the interact button in Souls games since the beginning of time. Doing this though, and I didn't realize it till quite later, it introduced a bug where since X is already used to advance the dialogue, if I hit X to advance dialogue, but X is also my confirm button, it double advanced the dialogue. But so that was really bad. Uh, and, and eventually I, I discovered the way to fix it was to just, you know, rebind and go back to what the default key scheme was and force myself to get used to using triangle as my interact button. But that definitely threw me for a loop because it seems like such a weird thing to have as a mistake. So all that being said, uh, to wrap things on up, I mean, I, I loved my, this, my experience with this game. Like I said, I, I spent... 85 hours, there's still stuff I haven't done that I want to figure out. There's mysteries that I want to solve. There's more things that I want to experience. And I mean, it's it's intimidating, but I'm certainly looking forward to trying to make the walkthrough of it. Uh, at the same time, I really, really think that FromSoft needs to take a look at PC performance because it's, it's just not good. Uh, and I really hope to see some updates to spells, mainly because, you know, the lack of balance and lack of poise spell, it's going to be rough. A lot of people are going to try casting spells. And, you know, because of that, I resulted in like finding one or two spells that were just really good that I could use some range and I, I spam those. But in general, I mean, I, I loved the game, uh, the summons in particular, the ashes. There are some absolutely wild ashes you can get that are so much fun. And those save my biscuit so much playing as a caster. So y'all will get to see all that stuff in the Let's Play. But closing thoughts, uh, I would give the game a 9 out of 10 and a tentative 10 out of 10, depending on future support. Because honestly, as much as I loved every second of this game, and I think it is by far Miyazaki's best game yet, the PC performance, man, it was, it was so damaging. That it, you know, I can't, I can't say this is a perfect game, not with the way it performed. Uh, but you know, console I heard is a lot better. So we'll, we'll say, we'll say nine out of 10 PC, 10 out of 10 PS5. How about that? Either way, uh, we are going to wrap this up because I still need to edit footage to this review and it's supposed to be live in two hours and I haven't slept and, uh, it's your boy. So thanks for tuning in. I'll catch y'all later. Uh, Let's Play starts tomorrow, and uh, yeah, 117 episodes. It's going to be juicy.